On Monday morning, I confessed to our morning prayer group that I was feeling numb. Intellectually, I knew that I should be feeling profound sadness or fear or a host of any other emotions, but I wasn't. I just wasn't. There were a number of reasons for that, I think. First, there is the isolation. I usually listen to the news when I'm driving, and I am not driving all that much anymore except to come here to record on Sunday, Saturdays. So that means that my world has actually gotten a whole lot smaller. And when I spoke on Monday to the morning prayer group, things had thus far seemed pretty normal, if very quiet, within my extraordinary limited sphere of existence. It was certainly not what I would expect a global crisis to feel like. Second, there is the scope of this thing. It's so big, it's worldwide, it's widespread and dispersed, and it's too big, too big almost, to get my head around. And third, and perhaps the most driving factor for me, feeling numb is defensive. I live with significant mental illness. In order to stay sane and actually survive, my brain learned at a young age to guard against the emotions associated with something as devastating and traumatic as this. On Monday morning, I confess that I felt numb, but significant cracks were starting to form in the foundations of that defense that I have relied upon for so long. Increasingly, because of the small snippets of news that I was getting, or because of Facebook, those cracks were appearing. There was the picture of the refrigerator truck parked outside of the New York hospital that was serving as an overflow morgue. There was the selfies, there were the selfies of medical staff wearing Halloween masks and their kids' page protectors from their binders as face shields because they didn't have enough. Then there was the text from Skip. Her mom was in the hospital, she told me, with congestive heart failure and a presumed stroke, and none of the family could be there with her because of COVID-19. And the follow-up? Skip got her mom home and on hospice, but it's incredibly limited help for her because of the shortage of staff that they're experiencing. Then there was the news from, that Martin shared with us all last week and the follow-up that he posted on Facebook later this week about the COVID-related deaths in his family. And on Wednesday night, the call came in from one of Lauren's best friends. On Monday, she had been told without warning that she was losing her job. And it was the end of the month, month which meant that by Wednesday, she had lost her health insurance. She didn't have any income, and she didn't know how she was going to pay for important medications that she had, or how she was going to pay her rent. On Monday morning, I was numb, and I approached our text from, John, from Mark 14 on a very intellectual level, analyzing the theology behind Jesus' admonishment of the disciples. On Wednesday night, I was drowning, and I wanted to scream at Jesus. After all, he had spent the entire gospel telling people to sell what they had and give it to the poor. Why didn't that apply to this woman? What made her so special? It seemed ludicrous to think that covering a single guy's feet in perfume, basically giving him a first century spa treatment, was somehow more loving than offering badly needed resources to the poor. What in the world? On Wednesday, I wanted to scream at Jesus. But then this conversation that we have been having at the presbytery level popped into my head. 
We have been putting together emergency assistance grant, uh, funds to, to form into a grant-making um, body uh, to provide emergency assistance to churches and pastors who right now are going to lose their income or their ability to pay their bills. The perhaps unsurprising thing is this. There is a clear, though by no means exclusive, divide among those who fall into the right now category and those who fall into the soon but not this week category. And that divide runs along the lines of race or class or whether you are a suburban church or not, whether you are in fact a rural or city church. church. As we started to discuss all of the places from which we could pull this money to support this fund, there was a conversation about how much we could provide and to how many. One person suggested a number that we could guarantee to every congregation in the presbytery. And when we did the calculation, we found out it was less than half of what someone making $15 an hour working full time would wake in a month. And at that point, one of the elders who was on the call, someone who was in the business world in his normal day job, said, we can't do that. That's a joke for those who really need it. It's a drop in the bucket. It doesn't provide for them in the way that we think matters. There was a lot of nodding at that point. And that's when we got into the conversation about different levels of need. Some of our churches and pastors were going to have greater need than others. Our granting program on some level had to acknowledge that. But this is where that divide that I mentioned comes in. Talking about imminent versus less imminent financial crises led to a deeper question about the structural issues of racism, classism, and privilege, and the ways that it has affected our churches. Yes, we have an emergent, an, an emergent need that we need to address, but on a deeper level, we recognize the need to change the deeper systemic issues that have allowed such unevenness in church finances to germinate and flourish. This is the work that we are called to do as leaders of the presbytery. This conversation reframed my understanding of the woman's actions and Jesus' response in this passage. Jesus says, you will have the poor with you always. It sounds pessimistic. And it sounds a little bit heartless and even counter to much of what Christ has said before, but he's not wrong. What if he was pointing out this very, very sobering fact? Unless we fundamentally change the way that our economic and political systems operate, we will have the poor with us always. Giving money directly to them is critical, yes. Giving resources is critical, yes. But it only addresses the immediate. It only addresses the symptom. And regarding this woman, 300 denarii, which was a lot, is only a drop in the bucket when one considers the vast, vast problem of first century poverty. What the poor really needed was an end to that. And that meant working to change society, to change political systems and the economy as a whole. And in Mark's gospel, that is the work of Jesus. Time and again, Jesus performs miracles that challenge the oppressive system of his day. Time and again, Jesus confronts the leaders who maintain these systems for their own power and benefit. Jesus is the one who successfully puts that change of the root problem into motion, and it is what will cause his death by the end of this week. We have the benefit of knowing that the story of Christ doesn't end there, 
There's the resurrection, which offers the ultimate promise. With God, we can bring about the kingdom of God. But the woman, the woman didn't know that. What she did know was that this teacher was actually making the kind of difference that brought fullness of life to people in the long run, which included pulling people out of poverty. With this as the context, I found myself putting myself, I found that I was putting myself into her shoes. Poverty was everywhere, and it probably felt overwhelming. Maybe she, like me, wondered what she could possibly do to make a difference in the face of such a big problem. Maybe facing the magnitude of it all, she couldn't come up with anything. Nothing, at least, that she really had the power to do, except offer her most precious possession and her very self to the one who was truly changing the system. She was making the choice to tackle the underlying illness, not just doing the still vital work of treating the symptoms. Honestly, it seems ludicrous to me to do something hyper-spiritual like offer myself to Jesus in this moment where over a million people have had confirmed cases of COVID-19 and where over 50,000 have died at the time of my recording this. Like, maybe I could do something a little bit more productive than just offering myself to God? And yeah, there are definitely things that treat the emergent need that I can and will do, like giving blood and donating, food, donating to the food bank and giving money to uh, different universities who have funds for displaced students and also offering emotional and spiritual support to all of you. But I can't cure this virus. I can't get my friend her job back and I can't provide her with health insurance. I can't raise the dead. Yet what if I can do something that would prevent dire consequences like these in a future crisis? Most of us know that there are systemic, economic, and political injustices that are making all of this so much worse. They've done a study now on cell phone data. They've done a study crossing that with presumed income, and they've found that those with less income are more likely to have to go out. They are more likely to have to put themselves at risk. Those with less income or little health insurance or no health insurance are less able to afford treatment then if they should fall ill. Parents who are paid hourly may need to choose between getting that paycheck, getting those hours in, and taking care of their kids. Low-income children might be missing out on some of their most important meals. And there's the worship of our economy that leads to some politicians saying, that Americans, especially older Americans, should in fact sacrifice themselves and be happy to do it for the sake of saving the economy. There are so many structural issues that we could choose to change that would make the future, any future crisis, less catastrophic on so many levels. For so many in the crowd on that Palm Sunday long ago who lined the streets with their branches, the adoration of Jesus was temporary. By Good Friday, we believe that many of those same people were actually in the crowd that was calling for him to be crucified. I would wager that that woman who anointed Jesus' feet wasn't one of them. In fact, I wonder if she was even in that crowd on Palm Sunday at all. The nard, the offering of herself, 
functioned as the palm because it, it was her way of recognizing who Jesus really was and of adoring and praising him for the Lord, the servant that he was. For so many of us right now, there is a lot of energy for doing our part to reduce the impact of COVID-19 on our society and on our globe. And that is so incredible. It is wonderful. That is something that we really need to celebrate. But I have heard so many people say that they don't think that this kind of action will last. They don't think that beyond this, our society will really change. In fact, they say to me, everything's gonna go right back to the way it was. That's certainly a pattern that we have seen in our country. But what if we all choose to follow this woman's example what if we all chose, in addition to dealing with those emergent needs right now, to offer ourselves to Christ, joining in God's work to bring healing not just to people, but to the system that sucks the life out of so many of us? Yes, let us give blood and offer contributions and make masks and feed people and do what we can right here, right now, but let us also pay attention, like this woman did, to what God is doing in the entire world around us. Let's learn how systemic injustice is making all of this so much worse. Let's brainstorm how we could act together in meaningful and productive ways to actually change our society beyond when COVID-19 dies down. Let's be creative and dream about what the kingdom of God might look like in this place. And in doing so, let's greet Christ on this Palm Sunday with a very different kind of palm branch, the kind of palm that actually has the power to transform our world. Friends, so may it be with us.